Good morning and welcome to this webinar. Today's subject is performing real ear to couple difference measurements and introduction. My name is uh, Helen Nielsen and I'm an event and marketing coordinator. And before I let uh, Lee Martin start our webinar today, I'll just have a few practical informations. All of the participants uh, are muted, and uh, that is uh, in order to reduce any background noise that might be. In case you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the instant message box on the left side of your screen. At the end of the webinar session, we will collect uh, all questions and they will be answered afterwards. In case you have any uh, technical problems or any questions concerning the webinar here, then please uh, send me an email directly uh, on the email address here. Now I will uh, give the word to Lee Martin, who is uh, today's presenter. Uh, Lee, please feel free to take over the presentation. So uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, I hope you can all hear me nice and clearly. Uh, if you're having any difficulties, then uh, as Hella mentioned, please uh, do contact her. Um, so my name's Lee Martin and uh, I'm an audiologist uh, by training and now uh, I work for the uh, Interacoustics Academy and uh, at the Academy we are responsible for providing uh, training and knowledge on audiological technologies and what we're going to do as Helen mentioned earlier is to look at one of those in a bit more depth today and that is the real ear to coupler difference. So let's crack on the whole session today really is to keep it uh, pretty practical and uh, I want to really focus on actually uh, performing the measurements and interpreting them. Actually there's two ways which you can measure the RECD with uh, the Callisto uh, and the Affinity uh, pieces of equipment offered by uh, Interacoustics and I want to go through uh, those two methods and give you insight on how to perform each one, the benefits and the limitations of each. After that, what I want to do is to then actually do a live demonstration, and I'm only going to choose one of these methods, and for the purpose of today, I'm going to use the SPL probe method. After that, what we can do is actually then look at the RECD that we've generated and see if it looks and appears normal, and if it appears abnormal, uh, what we can do is actually provide you insight into how to troubleshoot these measurements if you're getting something that's not looking quite right on the screen. So we look at what it should be and what to do if we don't get what we expect to see. Six weeks ago now, I performed uh, a webinar on uh, real ear measurements focusing on traditional real ear measurements. And I showed this slide during the uh, presentation. And what uh, it shows really is that hearing aid verification can be divided into uh, two uh, broad areas. Uh, Ear-based measurements, which uh, consist of your traditional real ear measurements, such as real ear insertion gain and real ear aided response. Uh, but the other branch of hearing aid verification is actually to use the coupler. And the main coupler-based method of hearing aid verification is to use the real ear to coupler difference. So what we're going to do is we're going to ignore the ear-based measurements and then give you insight into these coupler-based measurements today. And one thing I want to stress is that uh, when I'm talking about these coupler-based measurements, I'm going to be uh, talking about these in relation to the verification of a traditional BTE hearing aid with sound tube and ear mould. And that's important to note when you're looking at the configurations which I'm showing in the later slides that they might not apply to in-the-ear hearing aids, for instance. So we'll be focusing on the behind-the-ear hearing aid, and that's because these are the most commonly fitted uh, devices when using uh, RECD measurements. So it's important to kick off the day really with asking what exactly is an RECD? And uh, if we look at the DSL group, um, I just went to their website uh, a few days ago and uh, they define an RECD as a difference in dB across frequencies between the sound pressure level measured in the real ear and in the 2cc coupler produced by a transducer generating the same input signal. Well, that's quite difficult to read, let alone to digest. So hopefully what we can do is try and break that down. And what we're trying to do with an RECD measurement is actually to take two measurements. And what we do is we measure the response of the real ear. So what we're doing is we're putting a probe tube into the ear 
or we certainly do that for one of the um, techniques anyway. So we're putting a probe tube in the ear and we're looking for the sound pressure level at the end of that probe tube and uh, at the eardrum and that's going to tell us what's actually happening when the ear is um, with an ear mold in and occluded and then what we're going to do is of course have a, a coupler base measurement so we're going to measure the characteristics of the 2cc coupler using the same stimulus and what we're going to do is we're going to measure that at the microphone of the uh, 2cc coupler and then what we can do is we can subtract these two measurements and what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to actually give the coupler the characteristics of the ear canal and you might say why would you want to do that why would you want to make the coupler mimic what the ear canal is doing so what we're trying to do with this by allowing the coupler to now mimic the response of the ear canal is it allows for the objective verification of the hearing aid to be performed in the coupler without the need for the patient to sit in front of a loudspeaker like traditional real ear measurements. If you saw the webinar last time uh, we went through the whole real ear measurement process and that can take from five to ten minutes and there's certain patient populations which you just can't get to sit still for five minutes. So those are mainly the uh, pediatric population. Uh, of course we have uh, babies uh, which we're identifying through newborn hearing screening very early now and we need to fit hearing aids to them. They can't provide objective feedback on how the hearing aids sounding so it's really important that we provide verification uh, of the device in these groups. Uh, but of course to do a traditional real ear measurement that's going to be quite difficult. So what real ear to coupler difference allow us to do is to do a very quick measurement on the child's ear and then we can actually do the rest of the fitting and verification in the coupler so the child can be off playing and we can actually get a good accurate fit. So this is really the main application for forming this measurement. But what we shouldn't forget is the adult population and uh, I attend many adult clinics and uh, unfortunately I see that really to couple of differences aren't being performed in many. But there are some uh, applications in the adult population where RECDs are particularly worth doing. One of those in fact is uh, patients which have uh, special needs for uh, special needs patients which uh, you can't get to sit still for five minutes. So a traditional real ear measurement's not going to uh, actually be very beneficial here. Um, it's gonna be full of inaccuracies. So actually to do an RECD measurement in these uh, patients, then you can actually get much more reliable results and an accurate hearing aid fitting. The other patient population in the adult population uh, which can benefit from the RECD measurement is those with severe to profound hearing losses. What we often find with these patients is that they have very tight fitting ear molds to make sure that there's no acoustic feedback. And when you place a probe tube in the ear like you do for traditional real ear measurements, then uh, what happens is you get a significant amount of leakage of sound because the hearing aid is generating so much and then that can cause an acoustic feedback loop and that can be a, a problem and uh, again cause inaccuracies. So in these patients we find that uh, really a couple of differences can be useful. But today what I'm going to do is focus on the, the pediatric population. So uh, another question I hear from a lot of uh, clinicians is actually why do I need to bother to perform the real ear measurement? Because actually what we have now in the hearing aid fitting softwares is that uh, many contain averaged RECD data from uh, children from newborns all the way up to adults. So there's no real need to be measuring this uh, RECD because we have the average data. Unfortunately that doesn't quite translate to all our patients. Average data is going to be um, good for some but it's not going to be perfect for all. And uh, what the MHAS group did in the UK is that they looked at uh, different RECDs from children of the same age and what you can see is if I just place them over this graph we have five RECDs which are going to appear and we can see that they're quite significantly different so the child is the same age five different children and we can see that there's very significantly different RECD data which has been recorded from each of these uh, five children and actually if you look at the two extreme measurements 
uh, if I just highlight them here, so this measurement here and this measurement at the bottom here, then what you can actually see is that there's a significant difference between these two measurements of um, around about 20 decibels. So that can have a huge impact because one of these uh, children is going to be uh, over amplified and that could be causing potential damage to their residual hearing and the other uh, child could be under amplified and that's going to be really effectively the hearing aid is going to be a plug it's not going to be useful and it's going to have a negative uh, impact on their speech and language accusation skills. So why do these children display different RECDs and of course the answer is that they have different sized ear canals so I've just shown a couple of examples of how the ear canal can differ in shape and size and it's important to note that with uh, pediatrics ear canal variation is much more significant than in uh, the adult population so RECD measurements are really an essential measurement here and if you can't get an RECD measurement for any reason then of course we would re resort back to the average uh, data because that's better than not having anything but actually really to be making a accurate fitting we need to be doing the RECD. There's a big push now to provide individualized hearing aid care and actually if we're not taking into account the individualized uh, ear canal then we're really missing a, a big step here. This is a pretty good uh, justification for performing the RECD measurement. Once we've got the RECD measurement then what we need to do is we need to actually fit the hearing aid and uh, the process after this actually becomes pretty straightforward. It actually just consists of placing the hearing aid inside the coupler, inside the test box or on the coupler base on, as if we're talking about the Callisto and uh, then what you do is you would just run a traditional uh, real ear aided response and you'd actually match target exactly the same as you would do if it was just on the real ear. So the actual measurement process becomes very easy after you have the real ear to coupler difference. For that reason I'm not going to be uh, matching a hearing aid to target today. If you want to see how that's done then you can actually look at the uh, uh, real ear measurement and introduction webinar where I actually demonstrate how that can be done on the real ear but the process is the same if you're doing it on the real ear or in the coupler so uh, please feel free to look at that which is available on the Interacoustics Academy website if you want to know how to do that but what we're going to focus on as I mentioned is really these two methods of recording the RECD so there's two uh, and the most popular measurement method in the literature is to use the ear mold method and this is really the gold standard uh, because it's taken into account the occluded uh, ear response with the patient's ear mold in position. So uh, this is the one which we'll focus on first but the second method is known as the SPL probe method and this is becoming very uh, popular method of performing uh, real ear to couple differences Typically, uh, clinicians tend to do this when they can't get the RECD using the ear mold method. Uh, and the reason why you would use the SPL probe method is because it's much easier to perform than the ear mold method, and it's less susceptible to the errors which uh, the ear mold method can cause. So people are finding that the SPL probe method is a really nice backup for them, and uh, we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But let's focus on the ear mold method first. So as I mentioned earlier, the RECD requires two steps. We're taking the uh, real ear response and then we're taking subtracting the coupler response from it. And what we do in RECD measurements is typically measure the coupler response first. So that's exactly what we're going to do with the ear mold method and also the SPL probe method. With the ear mold method, what we need to do to measure the uh, coupler response is to actually have a coupler. So what you can see in the bottom of the screen here is a coupler and what it consists of is a microphone at the bottom, a 2cc coupler in the next uh, module here and then what we're going to use is a HA2 adapter because as I mentioned at the beginning we're going to talk about a traditional BTE hearing aid. Now uh, what we're going to do is we have that configuration set up and then what we're going to do is attach onto this HA2 adapter an RECD tube and that RECD tube is going to go into the REM headset 
which is actually going to be producing a stimulus. And what that's going to do is we're going to produce a stimulus and we're going to measure that at the microphone in the coupler. And what we're going to do is we're going to get a frequency response graph out of the other side. And with the frequency response graph, what we're looking is we have frequency along the bottom here, and then we have a, a decibel scale along this axis here. And what we're going to do is we're going to get a frequency response of the coupler. So we introduce a stimulus and we get a coupler response. And uh, we should expect to see this to appear uh, and look consistent every time we do a, a RECD measurement because the coupler never changes in its characteristics. So this is like our backup measurement to make sure that everything is still uh, the same and uh, looking correct. Once we have the coupler measurement, we need to do the real ear measurement. So with the ear mold method, uh, as the name suggests, we're going to use the patient's ear mold. So what we have is we have the REM module we have the RECD tube attached, but now it's not connected to the, um, the coupler. Uh, it's going to be attached to the patient's uh, own ear mold. So let's attach that one on. But as you notice, also what appeared on the screen and the other outlet of the REM module is the REM probe tube, just like what we use in traditional real ear measurements. And what we're going to do is we're going to place that inside the ear. And what we want to do is to have that to be representing the sound pressure level at the uh, eardrum. So what we're going to do is we're going to present the same stimulus from the REM headset and that's going to travel through the patient's ear mold and we're going to record what's happening in the patient's occluded ear. And what you'll get is a graph that looks a little bit like this. And what the software is going to do is it's going to subtract the real ear response from the coupler response and that's going to uh, give us a RECD curve. And what we expect to see is the RECD curve to be starting around about zero and increasing uh, positively as we increase in frequency. So uh, what we have is the RECD curve. Once we have the RECD curve, as I mentioned, the process becomes quite straightforward. What we can then do is allow the patient to go away. We, that process has only taken a minute or less to actually get that uh, really a measurement on the patient then what we can do the patient can be playing uh, with some toys maybe in the waiting area and then we take the hearing aid we connect it to the 2cc coupler place it into the test box of the uh, affinity or the coupler base of the callisto and then what we can do is just match to target and ensure that the hearing aid is providing the appropriate amplification to the prescription formula which we've chosen it to be amplifying to. So that's the ear mold method. Now what we can do next is to actually measure the uh, SPL probe method. So this works a little bit differently. So let's crack on with this one. With the SPL probe, uh, method, what we're going to do is to do things a little bit differently. Uh, as you can see, we still have the microphone in the 2cc coupler, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to change the HA2 coupler to a different coupler. And this coupler is known as the CalREM adapter. And uh, what we have is uh, when we have the adapter uh, placed on top of the 2cc coupler, we're in a position where we can measure the uh, SPL probe uh, response. So what we do is we need, of course, an SPL probe, and that consists of a, a device that looks like this. So it has the two uh, RECD tube and the thin uh, probe tube, and that's integrated into a single uh, device. And then what that's going to do is going to be placed inside the CalREM adapter. So we place that inside like that. And then what we do is we produce a stimulus from the uh, REM headset. And what we're going to do is to generate a frequency response graph, just like what we did when using the ear mold method. So here we go. What we can see is the coupler response. The coupler response remains the same because the 2cc coupler has the same characteristics. Uh, so pretty straightforward. Uh, and then what we need to do after this, after we have the coupler response, is to then measure the real ear response. So that's exactly what we're going to do. In order to measure the real ear response with the SPL probe, 
what we need to do is to place a tympanometry tip on the SPL probe and insert that into the ear and that will allow us to measure the real ear response. So we need to choose a tympanometry tip uh, which is going to be sufficiently large enough to actually block the ear um, to avoid any sound leakage and uh, here's one that we've just put on and then what you're going to do is then insert the uh, SPL probe into the ear and then you're going to press play or start in the software and then we'll generate the frequency response. So a sound will be played from the REM uh, headset, it will be measured in the ear by the SPL probe and we'll get the real ear response and then the, the Callisto or Affinity software will automatically subtract these two measurements and this will provide us with the RECD. Once we have the RECD then we're able to uh, actually do the fitting. There's just one thing we need to do before we do the fitting with the SPL probe is if you remember attached to the coupler is actually the CalREM adapter and that's the incorrect adapter to actually be using when verifying a BT hearing aid. So what we need to do is we need to change the CalREM adapter uh, to a HA2 adapter, attach the hearing aid to it and then just as before we then place everything into the test box of the Affinity or the coupler base of the Callisto and then we can just select the real ear aided response button and then we can actually match the target exactly as if the patient was sat in front of the speaker but in fact they can be off playing. So that's the SPL probe method. What I thought we'd do now is actually have a look at how we can do that in the software and uh, give you some tips and tricks of how to navigate the software and to get the best measurements. So what I'll do is I'll just switch over to the software itself. So in a couple of seconds you should be able to see uh, the Callisto suite appearing on your screens. So what we're going to do uh, with the uh, RECD measurement is if I actually start in the audiometry module, of course what we need uh, in order to verify a hearing aid is to have an audiogram and we can see that we've got a complete audiogram in this situation. We have that selected and then we can enter the REM software by selecting the REM tab. And then what we need to do is firstly choose a protocol from the protocol drop down list which is going to have RECD as part of it. As a default uh, protocol settings, the pediatric aided response protocol has an RECD in it, but for the purposes of today I've made a additional RECD protocol. So I just select RECD here. Now what's going to happen is once we've chosen the protocol which we're going to perform the verification to, we need to choose the prescription formula which we're going to fit it to. And uh, what we can see is uh, that we have a whole host of prescription formulae. I'm going to select the DSL prescription formula. Then what we need to do is to select the transducer which we've performed the, the audiometry to. And what it's important to do is to make sure that uh, when we're performing really a, a couple of differences that we get the best results actually when uh, using an insert uh, transducer. So I'd recommend for you to actually be performing your audiometry using inserts. And that's something to do with the calibration. If the, the insert uh, earphone is calibrated in a 2cc uh, coupler, whereas a super all headphone is calibrated in a 6cc coupler. So it's important to actually make sure that you're using the same uh, transducer coupler as the measurement coupler. So insert headphones are recommended. Uh, then we're going to choose the uh, hearing instrument style. Uh, we're going to use a behind the ear hearing aid. It's a digital hearing aid, so it's non-linear. DSL specifies if you want a quiet or noise program. We're going to say quiet for this uh, type. Uh, orientation for the REUR doesn't really matter because we're going to be doing it in the coupler. The vent size uh, you will select depending on the size of the vent and then whether or not it's monaural or binaural. Uh, for the purposes of this I would just say it's binaural. There's one actual important thing to do in addition to that settings is actually to look at the right side here where it says fitting prescription 
and what you want to do is to make sure that you have the correct coupler type selected and what we're going to do is use not the ear mold method but the SPL uh, probe using a tip so we're going to use HA2 tip uh, method here and that's going to allow us to actually be able to do the measurement correctly so once we have that then what we need to do is uh, if we come to the uh, the drop down menu for the the protocol and then we can see that the RECD is the first step which we can do and if you just press start what will happen is you'll get some instructions which pop up now these instructions are actually showing the ear mold method because that's what the software defaults to um, so as I mentioned we're going to be using the SPL probe method so what we need to do is to make a change in the software to use the SPL probe so I'm going to press cancel here and then what I'm going to do is right click the uh, RECD and then go into settings then what you have is these three buttons here and the last button or checkbox says use in situ SPL probe so that's going to uh, use this over the traditional uh, ear mold method so I'm going to select that the other thing that you will um, also see is that on the far left here you can actually use the RECD for both ears and there's been a study by uh, Kevin Monroe which actually says that uh, if the ears appear very similar in anatomy then it's actually acceptable to use the RECD data from one ear and apply it to both ears so if you can't get RECD results in both ears then it's perfectly acceptable to check this button and to use the RECD for both ears so if we press apply and OK then the software is going to be set up now for a RECD using the SPL probe now before we actually do the measurement just like with traditional real ear measurements we need to do a calibration of the SPL probe so what I'm going to do is click tube calibration select SPL probe and what we're going to see is uh, some instructions on how to position the SPL probe and what we need to have is the SPL probe positioned over the reference microphone and what we need to do is to hold that close to the, uh, the loudspeaker I'm going to press OK and we should hear some noise of the calibration okay so now we have the SPL probe calibrated we're in a position where we can actually measure uh, the RECD now the nice thing about the uh, Callisto and Affinity software is that it actually provides a step-by-step -step, uh, guide on how to do the RECD in case you haven't done it before so if I press start what it tells me to do is to insert the SPL probe into the coupler or into their CalREM adapter which is attached to the 2cc coupler and then press OK so I'll be quiet for this measurement and we should see the coupler response appear on screen if I just move the uh, dialog box down and then this is what we ex typically expect to see for uh, a coupler response and if you're looking at anything different to that then you might want to perhaps reconsider uh, recalibrating the uh, SPL tube to make sure that uh, there's nothing odd going on there but I'm happy with the way that's appearing so if we look at the dialog box it says attach an ear tip to the in situ SPL probe and insert this into the ear so I'm just selecting a tip now which fits my ear I'm attaching that on and I'm just going to present that into my ear just like as if I was going to do a, a tympanometry so that's just in my ear so I'll be quiet now and we'll run the next measurement okay and this is my RECD measurement here so what we can see is it starts around about zero and it increases positively as we increase in frequency and this is typically what we're expecting to see from an RECD measurement 
If you right click the RECD uh, button you can actually show the predicted curve on screen as well and what you can actually see is that my RECD appears to be quite different from the predicted uh, curve for the adult patient so it actually uh, shows actually how important it is to actually be doing these individualized uh, measurements on everybody's ear to make sure that the hearing aid is fitted correctly. Once that RECD measurement has been done, then what we then need to do is, if you remember the SPL probe method, is that we will change the CalREM adapter for a HA2 adapter, connect that to the 2CC coupler, and then we can then put the hearing aid uh, on the coupler base, and then we select REAR, and what you'll see now on the screen is uh, that in this uh, corner here, you'll see that you have, see a picture of a hearing aid attached to a coupler. This tells you that the RECD has been taken into consideration and that they, uh, the hearing aid is going to be verified now in the coupler. I think if we press start, you will see the instructions on how to place the hearing aid on the coupler base and how to position the loudspeaker. And then what you would then do is press OK and then see how well the hearing aid is matching to target. But what we're not going to do is we're not going to do that step today. We're going to uh, just focus on the measurements of the RECD. So if I press cancel and then bring you back to the presentation, then what we can do is to just look at the last few slides we have. So, as I mentioned, uh, and as we saw my RECD, what we expect to see is the RECD to start around about 0 dB, and then it should really increase positively as uh, we increase in frequency. And there are situations where that doesn't occur, and when it doesn't occur, you need to sort of ask the question, why is it not looking like a traditional RECD? Is that because there's a problem with the measurement technique or is that just because that's the way that the ear is? So let's have a look at some RECDs which uh, don't appear to be completely normal. So the first one we have is this RECD and what we can see is as I mentioned it should start around about zero and in this case it's not starting at zero it's starting way below uh, well even lower than minus 10 dB. So something's causing this low frequency dip. Uh, what could this be? Well actually it could be one of four things. Uh, the first thing it could be is that there's a tympanic membrane perforation. If there's a tympanic membrane perforation then you're going to be measuring a larger space than the ear canal itself. You're going to be taking into account the middle ear space and that will cause a dip in the low frequencies on the RECD. More commonly what we find is that we get this dip when we have a ear mold, uh, if we're using the ear mold method, which has been poorly inserted and sound is leaking out. If you're using the SPL probe method, then what we find is that the, uh, the tympanometry tip has again been poorly inserted and sound is leaking out. But it's much easier for this to occur when using the ear mold method. The other thing that can happen, of course, is that these uh, measurements are being mainly done in the pediatric population where their ears are growing rapidly. And what we find is that the, their ears are growing at a rate that uh, their ear mold becomes loose inside the, uh, the patient's ear. And therefore, that can cause sound to leak out and cause this appearance on the RECD. Uh, the other thing that you could happen is if you're using the SPL probe method is that if you use the tympanometry tip, which wasn't occluding the ear, and that could also uh, cause this appearance on the RECD. Lastly, which only applies to the uh, ear mold method, is that if you have an unblocked vent, uh, what we're doing with the RECD is comparing the occluded ear canal to the 2cc coupler. And uh, if you have this vent, then you're not comparing the occluded ear canal anymore. And then we're going to get a dip in the RECD. So if you're seeing this graph, then it's important to look to see if any one of these four criteria are causing it. So otoscopy can be used to uh, determine whether there's the perforation, and then you can do a visual inspection of everything else to make sure that everything's okay. Typically, what we find is that if there's no perforation, and then you repeat it uh, by repositioning the uh, ear mold, then we typically get a good RECD. 
Another issue that can occur when you're doing the RECD, this applies only to the ear mold method, is that actually you can get a, a suboptimal probe placement. So uh, what we can see here is uh, if we look at the probe in relation to the ear mold, we can see that the probe ending is just exactly where the ear mold is ending. And in fact, what we need this probe to be representing is the sound pressure level at the, the eardrum. So if you are not got the probe deep enough, then what we get is an RECD curve that looks a little bit like this. So it starts off normal, but it starts to then roll off in the high frequencies. And this is a sign uh, that there's sanding waves in the ear canal and that we need to uh, get a better probe placement. So what we need to do is to extend the probe so it's within five millimeters of the eardrum and uh, then we're going to be confident that we're going to then get a good RECD data. There are recommendations by the Modernization of Children's Hearing Aid Services and the British Society of Audiology in the UK on which probe tube depths to use and you can use this as a guide. So of course uh, for a young baby of uh, for four months you don't want to use the same probe depth as you do for an adult. Uh, there are recommendations on how long you should make the probe and how deep to place it inside the ear canal to get the best uh, RECD measurement. After the uh, suboptimal probe tube, uh, what we can also find is that there are some natural ear conditions that can cause RECDs to appear a little bit abnormal. And one of those ear conditions is uh, middle ear effusions. Of middle ear effusions, what we see is an RECD curve that peaks in the mid frequencies and dips again into the higher frequencies. Um, so we get an abnormal high peak in the mid frequencies. And uh, if you are displaying this curve uh, from a patient which traditionally hasn't shown a RECD data to look like this, then it could be a sign that the patient has middle ear effusions, and then you can confirm that by tympanometry. The difficult thing to do then is you need to make an assessment on whether or not the middle ear fusions are temporary or if they're a permanent feature. And if it's a temporary feature, then of course we would perhaps ignore the RECD because as soon as they go away, then the, uh, the RECD will return back to normal. But if they're going to be present for a long time, say a child that typically gets middle ear fusions throughout the entire winter period, then you would accept this RECD and actually perform the real ear measurement to this RECD measurement. The last thing we need to be aware of, um, and it relates back to the, uh, the, the software option of select the correct coupler type, is uh, that the ear mold method and the SPL probe method do provide slightly different um, RECD recordings. And therefore, it's really important to make sure that you've selected the correct method which you've measured in the fitting software so that can be taken uh, into account. So really that concludes what I wanted to say on uh, really a couple of differences today. So we looked at the two different methods of how to measure the RECD, the ear mold method and the SPL probe method. We then looked at the live demonstration of the SPL probe method and saw that we need to change that method in the software. One thing I didn't show you is that if you wanted to only use the SPL probe method or use it over the ear mold method, then you can actually set your protocol up so that check box is permanently ticked and that will always put the SPL probe uh, method first rather than the ear mold method. Then lastly, I showed you what an RECD should look like and a couple of tips to troubleshoot if you find that it's not looking like what you're expecting to see. Uh, what I'm not going to do is leave you uh, without anywhere else to go. Uh, we have a lot of information on RECDs on the Interacoustics Academy website. So uh, what we have is uh, some quick guide videos. So if you don't want to watch this whole presentation again, then what we can see is that we have two minute quick guide videos on how to perform an RECD using an ear mold and also how to perform an RECD using the SPL probe. If you want a bit more in-depth knowledge, then we actually have a 15-minute e-learning course on RECDs. And uh, of course, this webinar will be posted on the website too. 
And if you actually want to look at some evidence-based protocols, then they are also available in our related materials section. And we have the British Society of Audiology's really a measurements protocol, which includes a section on RECDs. So with that in mind, uh, I think I've running three minutes over, so uh, not too bad, but I will do welcome any questions from you and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Lee, for this uh, great presentation. As uh, Lee said, if you have any questions, then please feel free to type them in the instant message box on the left side of your screen. I can see we have one person typing at the moment. Question here, is adding the re RECD values to Gini necessary if we fit to target anyway? Does it just give a closer first fit if we do add values? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you're adding the values of the RECD in Gini, then what it's going to do is it's going to adjust the, the hearing aid gain to match what the uh, the RECD is that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be matching target so you still need to do the the verification anyway so it's uh, you're correct in what you're saying it's going to make it closer or hopefully make it closer to the fit uh, but you're still going to have to verify it and make adjustments anyway if anybody else has any other questions or comments then please feel free to to type them. Lee, do you have any other comment you want to add to your presentation? Uh, one thing yeah. that I often get asked is to actually position the probe tube and the ear mold in the ear of a young baby, which is wriggling and moving quite a bit, can be a bit of a challenge. And are there any clinical tips you can use? And there's three tips which you can, uh, you can use, really. Uh, the first is uh, to actually use a little bit of uh, Vaseline on the probe tube and the ear mold to ease insertion so you can actually uh, position those uh, a little bit easier uh, in the child's ear. The second is if you're going to be inserting the ear mold and, uh, and the uh, probe tube you can actually attach a little bit of uh, surgical tape to this to the ear mold to make a better fit. And then lastly, if there is a, a vent in the ear mold, you can actually pit the probe tube through the vent and then block the other end with some putty. And that will allow you to actually get a nice position of the, the probe tube. So that's uh, just a couple of extra tips. Thank you. I have another question for you, Lee. Yeah. Uh, in your demo, you measured the 2CC coupler first, but in the software, you have the possibility of using the pre-recorded RECD value. Why therefore bother measuring it again? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, for clinical efficiency, then maybe you won't need to, you don't actually need to measure it again. But what you need to make sure is, is that the everything's calibrated properly. And uh, by doing the, measuring the, the coupler response you can actually act if you see that the coupler response is looking the same as it should do each time then you know that the really a measurement that you're going to be taking is also going to be correct whereas if you're using a pre-recorded coupler response with a system which is not being properly calibrated then you could get uh, artifacts and errors in your RECD so it's just a way of uh, confirming that everything's set up properly thank you Lee Yes, we have one more question here. Uh, we saw that your RECD went up quite high at 8 kilohertz. Is this normal? Yeah, um, with RECD measurements, uh, one of their limitations is their um, accuracy at recording at the very high uh, frequencies. And this is why uh, we recommend really a measurements to be the gold standard as they're much more accurate at measuring uh, the high frequency information. So uh, yes, we do often see a, uh, a normal shift at the high frequencies uh, in the RECD date, uh, measurement. And it's something which we should take into consideration when uh, fitting the hearing aid. Should, so should we use that data at all for the target? Um, it's difficult to say. Quite often you're not going to have hearing aids which are going to uh, have a bandwidth of 8 kilohertz anyway. Um, if you do have it, then I would inspect the RECD and if it looks an abnormally high in those frequencies, then I would probably not 
use that very high frequency information for the target. Thank you. Um, okay, before we end, I just want to again, as, as Lee also mentioned, uh, bring attention to the fact that both on Interacoustics website and also on the Academy website, you will be able to find news about upcoming webinars. Uh, on the Interacoustics web website, you will mainly see new launch webinars, and uh, on the Academy website, you will find um, information about these uh, educational webinars that you just have attended. And uh, this webinar will be recorded and will also be available on the Interacoustic Academy website. And you will have access to the Academy website through the interacoustic.com website. So on the front page of the interacoustic.com, you will find a link to the Academy website as well. So here you'll find a lot of more information about webinars and e-learning. So please uh, have a look at that webinar or that uh, website. Okay, I think this is uh, it for now. I want to thank you all for coming and participating. And uh, feel free to write any questions uh, you might have afterwards to Lee Martin or contact me if you have any questions about the, the webinars in general.